Thank you, folks. Please welcome the directors of the film, Asaf Banit and Shai Hasgani. Thank you both for being here. Please welcome one of the participants, Dubi Barkan. Thank you for coming. And I'm pleased to welcome the moderator, Kobe Cohen. Kobe, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my first question will be to you, Shai. You are a history professor at the University of Maryland. What to you and to this type of a movie? <laughs> thank you so much for this question, and thank you uh, to the other Israel Film Festival. Um, so I came across uh, these letters 15 years ago, uh, almost by, by mistake, and I remember one of the first letters reading I read, and it's actually in the film, this is a letter of a soldier probably sent to demolish uh, Palestinian villages that were depopulated by uh, Jewish forces in 48, and he has this aha moment. He was like, oh, people lived here, they loved, they hated, now they're gone, and you know, what role did me as an individual, did the state have in this process? And I was really drawn to these letters. Back then I was uh, a journalist, but I, uh, within a very short time, left that world and switched to academia. Uh, and I used these letters um, to write my, my first book, Dear Palestine. And I was really, really fortunate to have found um, Asaf Banit, who's the director. I'm, I'm not a real um, filmmaker, co-creator of this film, but probably that will be my last. And I was really fortunate to, to join forces with him because, you know, as academic, how many people read your work, 100, 200, you know, I have my dissertation advisor here in the audience with us, and he can, you know, tell us more about, about that, but um, this was an opportunity to, to bring some of that story um, into wider audiences. It was a very enchanting and, and really, um, you know, something that I really was really hopeful to do, and, well, you'll judge, and the audience will judge how the results of this have been. Thank you. It is a powerful uh, movie, I must say. Um, we all, I guess. No, no, continue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I assume that uh, all of us served uh, in the IDF. It's mandatory in Israel. Um, but Asaf, you as the director, uh, what attracted you to make this movie, to make this film? First of all, I read Shai's article. He wrote an article about this report in Haaretz, in a newspaper in Israel. It was a very good article, I found, and I'm, uh, I was immediately drawn to it. I'm drawn to uh, closed society, I'm drawn to censorship, uh, to secrets. My previous film also dealt with the religious society who's, who keeps secrets. And for me it was like, wow, it's a challenge. If I can make this into a movie, that, that, that would be amazing. And we actually started a very, very long journey, the, the nature of uh, documentary filmmaking. Uh, and, and it's a very big challenge because these are like texts. It's a film that has the, the base was research and text. And I direct usually people. I don't deal with that. And I had to make it powerful and touching and find the, the right angles. And we went on this journey and uh, found people and found a way to, to um, you know, illuminate the subject and make it more accessible to viewers in, in Israel, which is like the obvious place to show it first, but also I hope that uh, non-Israeli viewers, and this is uh, the result. Thank you, and Dubi, uh, you know, we saw the letter from the chief censor actually encouraging the soldiers to share their thoughts and feelings in those letters. What was your experience as a field security who was reading those letters, while on the other hand, you had your own uh, secret in a way? Well, it was a little bit of an uh, uh, unbelievable situation, because I was young, I was gay, I knew I was gay, and I was in a position where I was reading letters of other people whom I suspected or knew from their letters uh, there were intimate letters that they were gay. Um, but it wasn't just a gay issue. It was the whole idea of going through personal letters and trying to find 
um, elements that might be dangerous for the army. Uh, I, I think that Asaf really managed to bring the spirit of those days to life. I mean, being that I'm the oldest person here, and <laughs> I'm talking about service of almost 50 years ago, uh, it was a totally different world. And being different, uh, having a different uh, sexual orientation, they didn't even call it sexual orientation. They called it sexual deviation. So it, it was... Uh, it was a strange feeling, and I really had to walk this fine line between protecting myself, being deep in the closet, but also having the uh, moral dilemma, what do I do with a soldier that's sitting in front of me when uh, I'm inter interrogating him for a position in a top secret job, and I realized this person is gay like me, do I report him? Do I destroy his career by informing on him? It, it wasn't an easy way to, to get through the day. Thank you. Before we're gonna move to my uh, next question, we have Lauren here. Uh, she will go with the mic. Uh, and if you have any questions, we're gonna open the discussion just after uh, the next question. So. This movie sheds a different light of the, eth the ethos of uh, the society in, mil uh, society, in society in uniform. I would like to hear your take about it. Chevra um, Megoyeset in Israel, it was a term that uh, described the, the whole uh, society. So, and it's an open question for the three of you, of course. Yeah, um, uh, let me focus on an anecdote that is also in the film, and I explored it a lot in my research. This is the chief of staff of the IDF who is sitting with his um, you know, top officers in 1949, and he's reading to them letters that were intercepted by Iraqi soldiers. And he said, well, we have a problem. They, they don't hate Arabs enough. Um, and so he's telling their, his officers, you know, when you send your soldiers, Mizrahi soldiers in general, into battle, tell them, that this is an opportunity for them to avenge what was uh, done to their parents in their countries of origin. And so our thinking that this um, society in uniform is an organic emergence, right, that just happens, I think is, is somewhat flawed. And you know, for me as a historian, it is really important to me to dig in and show how, what is the process that you know, gives rise to this. How was this, yes, some objective realities, certainly, but also an attempt from above, um, um, from the elites, the army elites, the other elites, to, to create these uh, ethoses and to make sure that they are sustained, well, now for, for over 70 years. For me, it's, it was a very personal angle. Well, I used to live in New York for a while. But <laughs> yeah, that was almost 30 years ago, before I joined the army. And then I came back to Israel to join the army, leaving here a very passionate uh, young girlfriend. And I used to write letters for her, every all the very personal, intimate letters, because we were away and we were in love. And, and, and when I read Shai's article, which was, I don't know, 20-something uh, years later, I was furious. I was, I mean, I took for granted, I took it for granted back then that they read my mail, but you think to yourself, oh, this is for, uh, you know, for the armies, for the nation's security, I accept that. And when I found out it was only to, f you know, to satisfy someone's curiosity or to find out my way of thinking, I was furious. And this difference is, is very meaningful. And it actually, all the people whom I interviewed for this film, they found the difference uh, infuriating because in the name of national security, uh, terrible things are done in Israel. And this was one of the things that I wanted to convey in the film. And actually, this is one of the most important debates that I have now in Israel. After this film was shown in uh, the Jerusalem Festival about uh, uh, two, two, three months ago, and I had very painful conversations with my family. Say, we are all, I was a very combat, I, I was in a, commander unit and uh, my my family were all like military men and it hurt them this film hurt them i mean here the audience would say yes it's very interesting but um 
Israelis still care about the army. I would almost say it's like the last, uh, uh, you know, it's the sacred cow, or it's the only thing they agree is like supposed to be holy. And then this film comes, and it tells very hard things about the army, not only the way they... And for people in Israel, I think the, the, the thing in the, the movie is called The Soldier's Opinion. And you join the army, and you think your opinion values. I mean, you're a partner here. Yeah? If they do something to you, it's for your sake. And then people found out you're not a, you know, you're a resource. They used it as, 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 um, in Modena, right? Intelligent. Intelligent resource. And raw material. Raw material. And this is like really the, um, there's a lot of uh, critical saying in the film, but during the last couple of weeks before I came here, and by the way, people were very troubled that I would present this film in the States, because these are things that we have to close between us. Yeah, this, this is why I always heard in the kibbutz when I was little. <laughs> we don't talk about it. Anyway, it's still hard for Israelis, and, I, and I'm glad this brings it up for debate. You do your laundry indoors. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and you write about it later. Right? Um, I just wanted to say, when you live in a mobilized society, like you mentioned earlier, you think that you take these things for granted. Uh, it's for the good of a country. Only later on you realize that some of the things you've done in the name of the good of a country, uh, you're not very proud of them. So. Are you in, in person? I mean, if I can ask you, how do you feel about it today? Well, I, I'm actually very impressed by the fact that you were able to make this film. I'm proud of the fact that you made such a film and are telling true story um, about Israeli army, not just the glorifying part, but the, the true reality, um, which unfortunately I took part in. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, I think it's great. Thank you. So, uh, Thank you. That was an incredibly powerful film. I really appreciate thank you. Uh, your having made it. Um, the, uh, but there's a big unanswered question here, which is that there was all this manpower put into this over 50 years. And the question is, wh what did they do with the information? I, I can't imagine that they just did it for their own voyeuristic intentions. I think uh, there had to, and not necessarily in a good way, but I guess, and in particular in terms of mental health and reading about hallucinations and suicidal ideation. I mean, I know now there's m much more attention to mental health, but what did they do with the information they had? Did you have a chance to talk to any of the people, you know, the in the military who read these reports and did any could I, I must and get any information from them as to what the thinking was, other than needing to spy on their own soldiers? Uh, I don't know if you if you noticed, but there are many like pictures in, in the film with the uh, army officials' heads cut off. This to convey the feeling that no one knows. You would ask the censors, we passed it on. And you would ask, and, and I actually interviewed the chief censor, who was chief censor for 25 years. And he wouldn't talk about it. That's the reason he's out, out of the film. The only thing he said, which was still like echoes in my mind, he said they were not men, they were not people, they were not human beings, they were soldiers. Uh, but y to answer your question, there are topics like uh, um, suicide or uh, sex no, sexual harassment is a, is a terrible example. But there are like small issues that you can see the effects of the report. Hazing, for instance, they really used it to, to eliminate, or not to eliminate, but to find specific people and get them out of the army. Suicide, they would sometimes, you know pass the name on and the commander would take the guy out and really like save, it's not in the film. Uh, by the way, sexual harassment was the worst because what they did in the 70s was to, uh, if they read a, a woman rep soldier writing that someone harassed her, they would take her out of a position, move her on and bring the next victim, which is mind boggling, it's mind blowing. But in specific, subject, you can see the effect of the report, but in the large scale and more, uh, you know, principal issues, like the price of occupation, it's gone. It's no one knows what they did and, and they knew about it. I would ask him, but, but why didn't, like you? And you, the only case, I know we, we mentioned it, was the case of Rabin, who really, that was a rare coincidence that he 
met the soldiers and then read their later letters the day after or the same day and saw the difference, which to some extent made him change his mind about you know, the, the efficiency of, of activating force. That's the only example. And you know, when I interviewed these people and saw the mass of reports, you see letters from 63, and you say, what a waste. I mean, you did it already. Like you, you, you went, you, you violated the privacy, our privacy. Like, do something about it. And it was gone. It was like you know, these things in the army they just disappear. And I, I want to add on to that. You know, we were for many, many years looking for okay, what was done? Was it good? Was it bad? What was the results of this massive surveillance apparatus? And I think you know, sort of trying to take a step back, and you know, I'm a historian, and to think, okay, so. We put so much money and resources, and this was just for soldiers, right? They, they, they did the same for civilians, the same for Palestinians, right? These sorts of monitoring of their letters. And so when I think about it um, today, in retrospect, after writing a book and, and doing this documentary, I think the idea is, is a sort of a, a control mechanism, right? So, you know, someone wants to make sure that, you know, the, the pot is boiling. It can simmer, it can simmer, it can simmer. They're trying to make sure that it doesn't spill over. Sometimes it does. Most of the time it doesn't. And you know, we saw some intervention when, when some you know, high-ranking people thought it may spill over. But most of the time, the idea was quite different. To see, you know, Ben Gurion wanted to know what people thought of what he did. And many um, leaders after him had that same idea. And they were sort of using this to a degree as a mechanism of overlooking at the, uh, at the Israeli society, the Jewish Israeli society primarily, um, from a distance and, and trying to make sure that, quote unquote, it doesn't uh, spill over. Oh, I would like to add something. Uh, as part of my job, I also had to investigate civilians who applied for a position with the army, especially with the Air Force where I was uh, positioned. And when you investigate a 30 or 40 year old not a 19-year-old soldier, there's a lot more material. And what surprised me was how much of the stuff that was collected when they were soldiers, when they were in their early 20s, remained on file 10, 15, 20 years later. And it was just amazing the amount of collected information that remained in their files. Yeah. Yes, uh, my name is Aham, and I served in the Israeli army in 1972 to 1975. Condolences, that was and, um, a hard time. I, not, uh, this film, I, uh, I, I share the feeling out outrageous, and I feel betrayed. <laughs> um, In, in the war, I was uh, one part of the war. I was in the Sinai Desert, and there was a helicopter that used to bring uh, us food. And I would write on uh, pieces of uh, 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 paper that uh, we had, and I write notes and give it to the um, helicopter um, uh, pilot. Um, and I wonder what happened to them because they never came to my uh, parents. But um, it's, did you get any kind of a responses like that from other uh, yeah. people? I, the film was shown about uh, two weeks ago in Israel on TV. And I received many, many such uh, reactions. I was there, and they took my mail. They, they, they pulled me out, and they say, what do you think? I mean, and the feeling of betrayal, like you said, that's what I was talking about before, because, you know, if you, if you violate my rights for the nation's security, that's one thing. If you satisfy your curiosity, I really uh, empathize with you. That's, that's the way I felt. That <laughs> actually, that feeling was what caused me to start to approach Shai and start making this film. So, <coughs> as a former soldier, you're a good person to answer this question, forgetting the ethics of collecting the letters and reading them. If you were put in charge, I have two questions. If you were put in charge of the IDF, what good could you use these letters for? And my second question, I, I don't know the answer. I, I, you know, I'm, I know that 
gay men in the U.S. military was controversial for the longest time, now is openly accepted. What's the status of gay men with the uh, IDF currently? Well, as far as I know, things have changed. And these days, it doesn't matter if you're gay or not, if they know about you, openly gay or not. Uh, it, it is not an issue anymore. But in the 1970s, uh, I served from 71 to 75, uh, it was definitely something you wanted to hide if you wanted to continue being in the service. And most people wanted to, to serve their country. There was no question about it. And you kept your uh, personal stuff, your, your sexual identity, a secret. Um, it, it was difficult because you, you get to feel ashamed of yourself that you can't be who you really are. To answer your first question, Yes, they were removed by uh, Doobie. <laughs> 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 Not personally, but Doobie's, you know, counter uh, uh, partners. Uh, to answer your first question, it's a very good question because I think in 48 or whenever Ben Gurion started, it's 49 or 48, started uh, making this report, uh, uh, the advantages were clear. He had to build a state and he wanted to know and he, I think he was afraid of also, uh, you know, different armed movements within the army and then you'd build a country and the information is valuable, is priceless. Later it changed because once the mechanism was more organized, I, I think, and that maybe would answer your question also, the army didn't know what to do with the ideology, ideological stuff he found out. I mean, when we try to see, they're like, for instance, the, the occupation. You can read letters, you know, I don't know if they say 10,000 or hundreds of thousand letters about the, the, the how hard it is to be, to, uh, to conquer people or to occupy people. It's 48, 67, uh, you know, period after period. And you think, what, what, what did they do with it? And I think, personally, they didn't know what to do with it. So that's also to answer your question. It's not the Army's issue. It's not the Army's concern. So they might pass it on, but even then, I mean, who cares? So I think as this report evolved, it changed. It was very ideological at first. It was to see, you know, where are the cracks or where are the irregularities who are ideological. And then it went to more specific, you know, drug use or sexual uh, tendencies, which they could work with because the big issues, the couldn't use it. Really. And I, I want to add that, you know, of course, army culture, and I uh, covered the Israeli military in the occupation for, for many years before switching to academia, right, is there's not a culture of truth telling. That's not just the Israeli case. That is the case for armies all around. But this report, which was produced by the army, is in some ways about truth telling, right? And so that created conflicts. And we have actually some really fascinating documents. They didn't make it into a documentary, obviously, because they can't have everything there. But you know, the, ch the chief of staff and some of the high ranking officers in the army upset at the chief censors for bringing forward truthful voices about things that they did not want to get out. And they were writing to him, you know, you can't write this. And he was like, no, this is what I'm doing. I'm not gonna, you know, he says to, create like rose colored glasses just so those voices don't come out. And so it's a rare instance where you have this quote unquote truth telling within a structure in which truth telling is not the norm. We're gonna take one more question in the audience. Um, do you think that these letters have changed uh, army training at all and how to change how people, soldiers feel about the military knowing this information? Um, that's two questions. Uh, I think uh, we spoke, I spoke to a censor who was in the, she served in the 60s when they really made an effort to uh, lower the cases of hazing and, and soldier abuse. And I think it did change it. Not only this, it was you know, a system effort. But I think a part of it, it, it worked uh, for to some extent. And I'm sorry, what, did it make the soldiers change their mind about the army? Uh, did it change how uh, soldiers are trained, become more ideological? Did it like... Oh, I, um, not training like... In, 
It it was it, it it had an effect. Yeah, in, in the in the in the War of Forty Eight, it had. They took. I think we see it a bit in the film. When they saw the soldiers were not hateful enough, they put more hatred into their uh, education, quote unquote. Yes, it changed. It, in the first series, it's, it's very clear that they use this material to change the way they train the soldiers. Yes. Afterwards, again, it's more uh, precise issues. Mind games. Why is there Mind games. Uh, Mind games. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Our time is almost up. Yeah, but um, I have one last question for you before we, we say goodbye. But we're still going to be here for a couple of more minutes. So you can come and uh, you know, talk to us uh, afterwards. Um, Asaf, you mentioned it a little bit from the family perspective, but what was the public's opinion in Israel about this movie? The viewer's opinion. The viewer. Uh, um, uh, Still monitoring their uh, Facebook posts. And <laughs> it was, I think, the most interesting review. It was quite widely spread. Read, you know, it's a documentary, so it's not, it's not a Netflix series, but it raised a certain in debate, which, and the most interesting one was in the Israeli news site and said that this documentary should have, how would you translate it? Sh no, should have blow up the country or something like that. Should have made a huge debate, but we're not, we don't even care anymore. But it's not really true. I had multiple di discussions with colleagues of mine, and again, like very painful talks with my father and uncle, whose uh, reaction Sorry, you make you make films. You need to uh, unplease some of the people. Uh, people um, are painful because of that film. They feel hurt. They feel betrayed, or the other side feel that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm using the army for my own advantage or showing uh, not accurate stuff, which is not true. I was very. We try to stay very, very loyal to what was said. It's not a. a film that does manipulations. Um, it causes a certain uh, turmoil in, in Israel. It's still, the army is still a, an issue that is hard to touch. I think one of the most subversive films in things in the film is that, you know, this guy who was, he was for 18 years head of army psychology in the army, he said the whole purpose of military psychology is not to help the soldier, it's just make him a better war machine, and it's true. And this for Israelis is, 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 my uncle was crying because of that. He said, no, no, it's not. And we had to do it. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a country and a, and a nation forged with force. There's certain things it, it's hard for them to hear. And this is one of them. <laughs> Hold on, man. Yeah, we, 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 could, we could talk more. We could. Yeah, just no, 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 but we're not, we're not opening in this way because then I just, we get Isaac, out of control. Well, and we like to control things here in the military. <laughs> Isaac, <laughs> just, uh, just uh, a couple of more seconds. It's very important to say what's in the end because I had a very hard time uh, finding that out. The army still monitors right. social media. Biggest advantage is that algorithms do it and not uh, people who actually read. But they, they, I interviewed with uh, an army guy who wouldn't be filmed because he would lose his ob job in the army. But he actually described how they, you know, they get into groups of Facebook or posts in Twitter, and they try to cross-reference and data, and it still goes on, and n not to mention Google, yeah, but. And, and I'm yeah. sure there's other monitoring that goes on. But I think it's important also to contextualize that this is not, um, this is not just about the past and about a yeah. system that doesn't exist anymore. It's about, it, it's very much, and I think everything you just shared right now as far as, as far as how the military is perceived and how soldiers are perceived is very much um, in the present. And, 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 and I'm sure it goes on, the, the elements we saw here go on even today. I want to thank you all for being a thank part you. of this. Thank you. Thank you for thank coming. You so much. Thank you, Isaac. I'll, I'll, s I'll say again, I, I don't think we did this completely knowingly, but this film leads beautifully into H2, The Occupation Lab, which is about soldiers in Hebron, um, our next film, which comes up at 7 o'clock. So please join us. We're here all week and join us for more. Um, these films are available virtually, too, so you can tell your friends to see these amazing films. Thank you very much. Have a good night.